Today's lesson will be uh, different than the rest. Today is supposed to be a review week. You know, every, the curriculum comes in 10-week units. Every week, 10 uh, is to serve as a review of the previous nine. And in fact, coming up, uh, not the next 10, but the 10 after that, uh, the fourth and fifth graders are going to come in and teach us our review. And it's easy to coordinate when you're married to the children's minister <laughs> for all that. Uh, so, in fact, they're teaching that to the, they're teaching review today to the elementary kids. Uh, and then they're going to come in with us here uh, sometime later this year, whenever 20 weeks is. So in, in place of review, we're going to just talk about a couple of different things that are fascinating to me, and I hope they are to you that will begin to, uh, at least it, it did for me, connect some dots for you um, and, and help us understand where some things in our world have come from. So we already dealt with this issue uh, concerning when we talked about creation and when we talked about the flood, that there are these myths around the world uh, Creation myths, the Babylonian epic being the most well-known of those. Uh, there are ancient flood traditions around the world. Uh, these, these stories that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And you, you can look at those in one of two ways. One, how a, a secular, unbelieving person would look at it and go, well, the biblical account of creation and the biblical account of the flood are just one of the many creation myths out there. It's just one of the flood legends that are out there. So those early believers in Yahweh uh, borrowed from those ancient cultures and created their own creation myth and flood myth and then you know, codified it in their holy book. And now you goofy Christians, you believe that it actually happened. The other way you can look at that is all of those creation myths, all of those flood myths actually stem from one central story. And over time and across cultures, they have been passed around and evolved over the years, but they all point back not to just another myth or legend that the Bible would hold, but to the actual truth and events of what happened that then pushes itself out into these other cultures. So that's also true with the Tower of Babel. As we've looked at it last week there in Genesis 11, uh, God has commanded humanity to spread out over the face of the earth and to multiply and fill it, and, uh, which is an echo of what he originally told humanity to do in uh, Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, all of that. Well, now post-flood, he gives the same instruction again. You are to have dominion over the earth, uh, multiply and fill it. And they don't. Instead, they rebel against God's clear commands and they all stay together. And as part of that, they build this monumental city together with it, a tower built into the heavens so that uh, they could be up in that place because that's where they believe they belong. This is humanity's struggle. We think we're God, and we would like to be in charge, not have him in charge. And God comes down and confuses their language and scatters them, and in that act of judgment accomplishes what he told them to do in the first place, go around the world and do all that. So from Babel, they, they all head out into their nations, into their cultures, and languages develop, and people groups develop, and cultures develop. Uh, from there. So if, if Genesis 11 is true, and we believe that it is, then what would we expect as cultures develop across the world? What would we expect as those stories developed over history? We would expect them to point back to the original culture. And that's what we see. They, you have one culture, one language, uh, one people group that are all there together in one city. Well, as it is scattered over the world, their government structures, their religious ideas, even their buildings 
will look like what they already know. So they build this tower. Again, when I said this last week, when I always pictured the Tower of Babel, I thought of like the Toronto Space Needle. Uh, It's just this narrow thing that goes way up into the sky. Uh, That would not have been what they built. Uh, they, They would have built a pagan religious structure known as a ziggurat. So we've got a picture. Will you put one up? So that's what it would have looked like. So biblical and secular historians agree on this. So this isn't just a, you know, Christians are making this up. Uh, the non-Christian world goes, well, yeah, that's, that's what the ancient culture would have built. So it's got tower. It would have been used for, uh, again, uh, pagan religious ideas because they certainly weren't uh, very faithful to the Lord uh, there in Babel or any time before or any time after, really. So, again, this is an artist representation of, of what the Tower of Babel would have looked like. We're not certain where it was. Again, we don't know if we've found that tower or not. There are a couple of candidates in modern-day Iraq. But what seems to be clear is it would have been shaped like this one. Um, and it just so happens that uh, one of these ziggurats was dug up in Iraq, close to where ancient Babylon would have been. Go ahead and put up that picture if you would. Hmm, indeed. So again, there, there's no proof that that is the Tower of Babel, but it's, it's within spitting distance of where the Tower of Babel would have been. Uh, so you've got these, these pictures, this idea of this is what these step pyramids, these ziggurats would have done. But then you've got this, go ahead and put up the third one. These are all around the world. These are in South America. These are in Asia. Where did that come from? The original. Thank you. So you've got this similar structure all around the globe, separated by continents and oceans, separated throughout the centuries of history, yet they all look the same. How could that possibly happen? Is it because the Tower of Babel was built on the model of what the surrounding ancient cultures already had and they borrowed from it? Or could it be that there was an original structure that as these people groups are scattered out around the world, what do they take with them? They take their knowledge of what structures to build. And there they're going to build similar structures that they've already seen before. And they saw it in Babel. And throughout history, these structures have been used for religious practices, just like it would have been happening at Babel, an attempt to replace God. Throughout history, this is where human sacrifices were offered. Uh, other wicked practices to honor false gods. Again, where does that come from? It comes from Babel, because that's what they were doing at Babel. They were in active rebellion against God, offering false worship of him. So again, what is the biblical explanation for the occurrence of all these structures? Well, we know. God confuses the language and scatters them across the earth, and as they went, they carried this information with them to the other cultures, to the other nations that they began to form. And when they anchor in a place and decide they're going to worship whatever gods they're going to worship, that's what they build because that's what they know to build. Therefore, the memory we would expect of those cultures all over the world is going to be the memory of the original truth that went down. This is what we talked about it with the flood. Why are all these flood legends and flood myths around the world? Because there was a flood. And as they scattered across the world, those, that story begins to develop over time and names change and places change. Even the names of the gods change. So when you were a kid, did you play telephone? And one person starts with the original story and they whisper to the person next to him and then by the end of it, it's something completely different. Well, that's, that's how it happens. If you've got 10 you know, elementary school kids, it's going to change by the end of the 10. Think of a couple thousand years over different cultures. The names are going to change. The places are going to change. But it's all built on 
this original truth that actually happened. So, several years ago, I preached a sermon series called Epic. Epic, not meaning like cool, that's epic, but an epic story. Uh, that, that there are these familiar stories throughout all of history, throughout all of cultures, even to this day, that uh, there is a kind of story that pulls at our heartstrings. There is this beloved princess who's held captive by some sort of enemy or a dragon in a tower, or whatever it might be, and the hero goes to rescue the damsel in distress and defeats the enemy, and they ride off into the sunset living happily ever after. That storyline has been repeated millions of times throughout history and in the books that you and I read. Why is at the end of a good movie, you're mad if the villain doesn't get killed at the end? Why does it frustrate you? Because you know this is not how it's supposed to happen. The hero is supposed to kill the villain. What happens if the hero doesn't get the girl? Well, why did I even bother paying $48 for a movie and popcorn? <laughs> I mean, this is how it's supposed to go. They're supposed to win, supposed to get the girl, supposed to do all of this. Where does that storyline come from? You ever had popcorn at the movie theater? It's like $3 per piece of popcorn. That's why I don't do it. Then it's, you know, $1.50 per sip of slushy. Uh, it's, it's, it's utterly ridiculous. So all of those legends, all of that storyline, you could look at that and you could say, you know, that's kind of the storyline of Scripture. I bet the Bible borrowed from all those pagan myths throughout history and wrote its corresponding storyline. It's just one of the stories. It's just one of the myths. Or you could say there is a core storyline written by a divine author of a precious bride who's held captive by an insurmountable foe. But the hero comes and defeats the dragon, Revelation 12, defeats the enemy, rescues his lovely bride, and they live happily ever after forever. From that core storyline, all of the stories of the world have flowed. And that is why, to this day, when you read that book or watch that movie, you are drawn in, and this is how it's supposed to go. How do you know this is how it's supposed to go? Because that's what the Bible says it's going to be. This is our story. This is our epic. And the world has simply hijacked it and made it their own. So it should be no surprise that these legends exist. It should be no surprise that these myths exist. We've seen it with creation. We've seen it with the flood. Now we see it with Babel. We're going to see it with the broad storyline of all of Scripture as God rescues his people through Christ, the hero of the story, to take his bride home. This is the story of all stories. And all stories in the world simply borrow from it. So let me give you a couple of examples of some of these myths throughout the world. And you tell me where they came from. Here's one out of Guatemala, the Quiches of Guatemala. Tell of a time when their tribes multiplied and they had to leave their old home and go to a place called Tulin. And there, their language changed. And the people then sought new homes in various parts of the world as a result of not being able to understand one another. How does that story get to Guatemala? I know. It comes from Genesis 11. So they're gathered in one place in their myth. Their language is confused, and therefore, because of their confusion, they have to spread to other lands. In India, the Makir tribe lives in northeastern India, tells of the descendants of Ram, who were strong men, and they were growing dissatisfied with the earth, and they aspired to conquer heaven. So they built a tower. And I quote, higher and higher rose the building till at last the gods and demons feared lest these giants should become the masters of heaven as they already were of the earth. So they confounded their speech and scattered them to the four corners of the world. Hence arose all the various tongues of mankind. 
So that's their story. You've got a desire to make a name for themselves. They've already conquered the earth. Well, what's next? We got to conquer heaven and the gods are intimidated. Yeah, right. And they come down, they intervene, they confuse the language and scatter them all around the world. How does that get to India? That came from Babel. The Polynesian islands, the Polynesians on the island of Hau say that Rata and his three sons survived a great flood. And then they made an attempt to erect a building by which they could reach the sky so that they could see the creator god, Vatia. But the god, in anger, chased the builders away, broke down the building, and changed their language so that they spoke diverse tongues. So a man and his three sons survive a flood. Hmm, where does that come from? They try to build a structure into heaven. God thwarts their efforts and their language, language is changed. So again, we have these myths. We have these stories all around the world. Where does it come from? One of two options are true. Either the Bible borrows from them and we're just a copy of what's happened around the world. We're just a product of the pagan cultures around the world and we took the stuff we liked and made it our own and now stupidly all these years later we believe it to be true when it's just another myth or it's not a myth. It is the source of all the other stories, of all the other events. That's way better of a way to view it and it fits with our belief that the Bible is true. It's the true history. Uh, you know, Jordan Peterson, who it doesn't seem to be a believer, uh, you know, the 12 rules, all, all of that, a psychologist. Um, you can't go on YouTube without seeing videos by Jordan Peterson. Uh, in an interview that he did with Joe Rogan on the Joe Rogan podcast, the most popular podcast in the world, uh, he said, after reading the Bible, after studying the Bible, he said, the Bible is truer than true. Yes and amen. It is literal history from which all the histories of the world have simply borrowed. This is the ground upon which we stand, friends. This is our hope. This is our foundation that it is true and we have no reason to fear what the world would bring our way. We stand on truth. So, that's way more fun to talk about than a review week. <laughs> oh. Yes, sir. I see that hand in the back. Oh. <laughs> Can I speak that these things came from aliens? Yeah. And how much are your overlords allowing you to say? Yeah, it's, it's all about alien knowledge. Well, in one sense, you could say that all of our knowledge is alien knowledge because God exists outside of this world and is alien. Um, so we, we could say that, not in the sense that God is an alien, like E.T. or whatever, uh, Alf, whatever you want to uh, call him. But outside of ourselves, yes. Uh, so Casey, I was talking with somebody about it last Sunday. Um, I can always tell who's doing a Bible reading plan through the year because they ask me questions. Um, and I can tell by the time of year what questions they're gonna ask because I know where they're at. Uh, and it, so, you know, March gets me a lot because it's Leviticus and, and all of that. But one of the, the things we were talking about uh, is the, the pattern of the tabernacle and all of that. You know, they had to move this, it was a gigantic structure, the Israelites out in the wilderness and, and all this, this elaborate stuff that is in the tabernacle and then eventually goes into the temple all of that was built by the instructions given from God after the pattern that was in heaven. So all the stuff that was in the temple, all the stuff that was in the tabernacle is in heaven. And what we had on the earth was simply a shadow built as the pattern of what's there. There's an altar in heaven. There's a table of showbread in heaven. It's all, it was already there and we get the picture of it and then they, they build that. So our, our knowledge is alien, but for the specific thing that you're talking about, um, the, the view that says, this is, this is how we built that, you know, the pyramids, the, you know, human beings could never build that, uh, so it, it had to be the aliens 
uh, to do all of that, which, how do you get to a point where you go, well, it, ob- it was obviously aliens. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how you get there, but, but, but they get there, that it was obviously aliens, um, because that's, that's the argument even of how life got to the earth. It's, it's called panspermia, uh, that human life was impregnated onto the earth by an advanced alien species, and, and, and that's how we explain how life began. Well, actually, it's not, because all you've done is back it up one step, because where do the aliens come from, and how do they start? You know, are they gods? You know, what, what, we got to know. So that doesn't actually answer any questions uh, for us. So the, the fact that people anchor on, well, they, they couldn't have done that, so the aliens did it, is built on a false premise. And here's the f- <laughs> one, that there's obviously aliens. I mean, we, we don't know that. Be cool if there was. Um, at least if they're friendly. Two, here's the false premise. Ancient cultures were stupid, and we're smart, and if we can't build it, they obviously couldn't. That's where that comes from, Um, because they're so ignorant that uh, there's no way they could have pulled this off. That's a false assumption. These ancient cultures were quite advanced, quite intelligent. Um, Again, if you watch any videos on Pyramids and all that, you know, we've unearthed stones that we still don't know how they moved them. We still don't know how to move them. We can't to this day move them. Uh, so they, they are way smarter than we give them credit for. Uh, read through the book of Job and you'll see this. So a couple of times, Job and his friends, as you know, if you've read Job, you know it's just mind-numbing in the, in the middle chapters because it's just a bunch of poetic speeches. Um, Job's got all this suffering, and then the three friends come. They don't speak for a week because they're overwhelmed by his tragedy, and that's the great thing that they do. Then they speak and ruin the whole thing uh, because their argument against him is you're a sinner and God is punishing you for it. If you would just repent, God will make all this go away. It's where the idea that um, you know, bad things don't happen to good people because there are no good people. Um, all of it, God's punishing you. That's not, we know from Job 1 that's not true. Uh, God is not doing Um, punishing him for some wrong that he had done. And Job will speak and defend himself, and then Eliphaz will speak, and Job will respond, and then Bildad will speak, and Job will respond, and Zophar will speak, and Job will respond, and then Elihu comes later, and it's just back and forth and back and forth, and you just read it really fast. That's how you do it, is you just sit down and just read through it. Otherwise, your eyes glaze over. Um. If you are paying attention as you read through that, what you will see is, is them mention star constellations, Pleiades and Orion's belt and all of that. Job was a contemporary of Abraham. And they already have names for the constellations in the sky. They're advanced in astronomy. How does that happen? These people aren't dumb. These people are quite intelligent. Uh, advanced in so many ways. Uh, so that, that whole view, Bill, thank you for bringing that up, is built on that false assumption. We're, it, it's, uh, C.S. Lewis called it chronological snobbery, that we're smart, everyone before us was dumb. Uh, we, we've got it, they were all wrong uh, beforehand. And um, this even happens in church world uh, where um, young Preachers think they are the answer to all of the problems in the church for the last 2,000 years. Uh, that, man, if they just would have had me, I, I, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, in my younger years, I can neither confirm nor deny that, uh, that reality. But that's, you know, everything we did before was stupid. Uh, everything was bad, so we now have to reinvent and do a bunch of new things, and that's better. Um, friends, you're currently sitting in a Sunday school class. Churches haven't done Sunday school in 25 years. But we turned back the clock and went back to things that we know work. They worked for us, didn't they, growing up? And then we decided, all that was dumb. We know better now. We're going to do something else. How's that worked out for the church in the last 25 years in America? Were we better off than we were 25 years ago? No, absolutely not. We're far worse than we ever were. Biblical knowledge is at an all-time low, historically. Um, So, all that to say, 
We're not as smart as we think we are, and they're not as dumb as we think they were. Yes, sir? Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, th- there's always that case where uh, all, all those who discount the Bible always assign false dates to these things. We've, we've seen that with creation, um, with, oh, well, yeah, this can't happen, but add, you know, a few billion years and it can. Well, no. Things that can't happen can't magically start happening over a couple billion years. They still can't happen. Uh, because that's, that's the answer to evolutionary teaching, is, well, anything can happen over that amount of time. <coughs> well, except for things that can't happen. Sure. Um, a lot can happen over millions of years. Well, a lot can happen over a couple thousand years, too, a- as we've learned. A lot can happen in, in a few minutes. Uh, we, we've learned that to be the case. So, uh, for me, I, I simply dismiss all the dates that that secular people place on anything. They, they would put Babel as you know, a few thousand years ago, they, they would have it to be predating uh, where we know. So Babel takes place about 100 years after the flood. Well, we can, we can date that because of the historical record of Genesis. In fact, I've got it, just give me a second. Um, it's in some of my other notes. At least I think it is. Well, you know, the nerds run the world. So bring, bring it on. Everybody eventually works for the nerds. Um, so I know. Um, 2349 BC is Babel. Uh, so we, we can measure with a, a high amount of precision when this stuff goes down. So they will obviously look at these, these cultures and go, well... You know, the, the pyramids of Egypt were constructed in 2600 BC, um, you know, and those are the oldest pyramid structures. You know, in Peru, they're built around 3000 BC, and they borrowed from ancient structures before that, and all that. Okay, it's the same faulty arguments that date evolution. Um, so we, we dismiss those. We have one objective source of truth, and that's scripture. Science is not an objective source of truth. Never was, never will be. Uh, because science changes all the time. Uh, and if you don't believe that, j- Google's your best friend. Uh, just look it up. And uh, y- you will see that what is scientific fact a century ago is a joke today. Uh, because here's what I know. I've never been to the doctor where they did bloodletting. I know that. Dr. Cat has never done that to me. And I, I hope he never does. But there was a day that was leading Bleeding edge, ha, see what I did there? Uh, bleeding edge science, bloodletting. Um, nope. Uh, it, it's, that's actually really bad uh, science. Uh, so again, we, we dismiss those and we, we go to scripture. That is our foundation. Uh, so we, if somebody says, well, you know, this happened or whatever, it's like, okay, go back. How do you get those dates? Where are you finding those dates? Are those objective? Is that real? And what they'll find is no, it's a guess. Ours isn't a guess because we can date it from the historical record of Genesis. Yeah. We have two minutes. All right, one, two, three, go team. See ya.